I'd like to introduce Kamal Gungor, who works for Eno, and he'll be presenting and looking after you through this session. We also have Matreya, Shah, and Bjorn Lubetsky, um, who'll be filling in as well um, this afternoon. Uh, Kamal, welcome. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for having us. And hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me and see me properly. Uh, it's very nice to, to be here uh, in the framework of this conference, the biggest in Scotland, on self-directed support. And, you know, it's a pleasure for, and we are, you know, very thrilled to have the opportunity to present a workshop in this framework on artificial intelligence and its intersection with disability and maybe a bit more with independent living. It's something we hear people, you know, uh, asking us how it works and how it is relevant for people. Because, you know, nowadays artificial intelligence is everywhere. So people are questioning how it affects also our independent living. And we know from uh, different re researchers and, uh, you know, from people, from experience, that it can be super beneficial and it can enhance our independent living, but it can be also, it can also put, has significant risk, you know, it, which could be, includes discrimination and exclusion for disabled people even more sometimes. So this is the reason we have this workshop today, and we have two great speakers with us. One is Maite Ashar, who is currently conducting a study for the European Network for Independent Living and in the organization I work for. And uh, he will share with us, you know, his experience of the, with the study and his work in general, you know, on AI and disability. So we will see, you know, some findings and some of the interesting things. And also we have Bjorn Lubetsky from Bridge the Gap, who will speak about their efforts, you know, how to make the tech world more inclusive. And additionally, Bjorn will, you know, delve into artificial intelligence and its potential, but also its challenges. So I think you will have a very nice session. Uh, you know, we will have first Maitre and then Bjorn, and then there should be time for Q&A. And finally, before, before giving the floor to Maitre, very quickly, a couple of words for the organization we represent, the European Network for Independent Living, who is hosting the session. I mean, together with SSDS, of course. Self-Direct Support Scotland, SDSS, sorry, who is our member, by the way. So we are a European network of disabled disabled net based in Brussels. We have members organizations like Self-Directed Support Scotland in other case, but also individuals. And we advocate for independent living, choice and control of disabled people, how to live in community, and our right to live in the community in contrary to institutions and this stuff. So we advocate strongly for the institutionalization, personal assistance, and all other support services that, that could help us to live with choice and control in the society. And we have also a very strong youth network, and we work, you know, with our members on European level, on national level, we support when needed, and we do a lot of other things that I invite you all to see in our website enil.eu, enil.eu. So, and we will put it in the chat while people are speaking. And yeah, I stopped speaking here and bothering you with my annoying noise. My annoying voice, I'm sorry, with my annoying voice. So I will give the floor to Maitreya. Maitreya, welcome. Thank you for joining from the US, which should be very morning for you. And yeah, we would like to, yeah, tell us a little bit about you and yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kamil, uh, for this very generous introduction. And I, uh, I'm very glad to be here from uh, joining from the US on a rainy morning in Boston. Um, and uh, I'm very glad to present this findings from this uh, study that Kamil said we have done. Um, uh, at NL. So I'm just trying to share my screen. You can hopefully see it now. Oops. All right. 
Yes, we can see everything. Thank you. Uh, it's it working. It works perfectly. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, um, a bit on my introduction first. So, I am a lawyer by training. Um, I am a person with disability myself, and I am a researcher. I'm currently working at Harvard University as a fellow uh, at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. My a lot of my work is uh, been on the intersection of technology and disability on uh, on the risks and challenges of AI on the governance of uh, artificial intelligence and automated uh, systems and so on. And I'm very glad to have uh, worked with Enel on this study on AI and independent living. So firstly, uh, what is this uh, study about? So uh, Enel uh, really wanted to understand uh, what the experiences of people with disabilities are with uh, artificial intelligence and algorithmic technologies. Um, specifically, how do, do these technologies impact the independent living of people? Um, some of the questions that we we addressed in the study were um, on on the benefits, the risks, uh, privacy challenges, um, trust, safety, and so on. Um, we uh, took a triangular approach, and uh, I am I think I'm I'm rather feeling uh, quite excited about this because this is one of the first studies I could say that has captured the actual experiences of people with disabilities with AI technologies. So we, uh, in in a span of around four to six weeks, we uh, did a triangular approach. We firstly mapped and gathered literature on AI and independent living. Um, we did an online survey where we received a response from 16 different participants. And then we also did a focus group discussion where we received response, uh, where we received participation from 10 uh, people with disabilities from across the European Union um, and United States. Uh, people with different gender, uh, different types of disabilities, and, and different uh, demographics. So I think I'm very excited to present these findings. So, so to start with, um, what is AI at a very fundamental level? Uh, so there is no singular definition or meaning of AI. Uh, every person and institution defines it very differently. So for this study, we have loosely defined artificial intelligence to mean computer systems that uh, can perform tasks that were conventionally performed by humans. Um, and you will uh, understand as we go along as to uh, why this particular definition is so important in the context of independent living. Um, when you talk about AI and disability particularly, many companies are developing assistive technology and accessibility products for communication, learning, education, and employment of people with disabilities. Uh, even the idea of inclusive design is is gaining a lot of traction um, in technology de uh, development. So uh, this is this is what we loosely understand when we when we say artificial intelligence, right? And we're not going into the deep uh, meanings and deeper technical um, uh, underpinnings or de deeper technical meanings of of AI. We are we are taking this loose definition right now. Um, you know, before we delve into the intersection of AI and independent living, I think I'd also like to uh, briefly touch upon the uh, the exact philosophy of independent living. Right? And I'm I'm quoting the man himself, Dr. Dov Ratska here, uh, uh, to say that uh, independent living is a philosophy and a movement of people with disabilities, right? And it is about uh, personal autonomy, choice, and self determination of people with disabilities. Um, it is not about, and, and I'm quoting Enel's uh, a lot of uh, uh, important work here to say that we are not uh, talking about a utopian uh, independence free from human support. We are rather talking about agency, rights, and choice of people with disabilities and control over their life. And all of this is very important in the context of, of AI, and we'll, we'll talk about that as we go along. But this is, I wanted to premise this presentation on this understanding of what independent living is. Um, so what is the intersection of AI and independent living? Right? Uh, we have been talking about the intersection here. So uh, AI uh, has a lot of potential for people with disabilities. Um, uh, many There are many articles that uh, refer to AI's potential in, in helping people with disabilities. So some of our focus group discussion participants said that uh, they have been using uh, AI tools uh, for their, uh, you know, for dictation and so on. And 
these tools have been accurately recognizing their non-normative speech. Uh, so we have also heard from people uh, who use um, technologies for image description and image recognition. Um, oh, sorry about that. Uh, especially blind people who use these technologies and so on. So there are many different avenues here of how AI technologies are providing independence to people with disability uh, and how they are reducing their dependence on, on human caregivers. Uh, so that's the positive side of it, right? And here is, is, is uh, some data from our study. So over 63% of our participants said that they use some form of assistive technology. 43% uh, of our participants uh, said that they are using voice assistants like uh, Google, Alexa, or Siri. Um, you know, 50% of our participants say that, uh, with, and that too with different disabilities, said that they are using dictation tools like Speechify. Um, and, you know, to, to also showcase the adoption of very advanced level AI technologies these days, like ChatGPT, which has a lot of hype, uh, a majority of participants said they have also either used or they are currently using ChatGPT for different uses. Right? People also said they are using fitness tracks, fitness uh, bands and apps for management of their health illnesses, such as diabetes and so on. So there is a wide adoption of, of, of uh, AI tools by our participants. It's something that uh, we learned from this study. Besides that, uh, this is our first theme from, from both the survey and the focus group discussion, the adoption of technology. So uh, the European uh, Disability Forum in its report says that people with disabilities are usually early adopters of technology. Um, in our focus group discussion, I think people were generally uh, excited about technologies. Some also said that uh, AI could virtually do anything for them. Um, over 68% uh, of our participants said that they learned about AI tools from social media and internet searches. And, you know, we in, in our disability rights movement, we talk a lot about um, digital uh, divide for people with disabilities and how it lack, uh, hampers their access. Uh, this is a, probably a very good evidence that we have generated here to showcase that if people with disabilities have access to internet and to social media, it also gives them information about many different technologies uh, and, and assisting them in using these technologies, right? So this is broadly our, our theme on adoption, some of our findings there. Um, these are the risks. We have already discussed the benefits, right, and how people with disabilities are, are receiving benefits from these technologies. But from the literature that we surveyed, we what we have realized is that AI technologies also pose many risks. To give you a few examples, um, a lot of AI technology is based on uh, data that is uh, that has societal biases against people with disabilities. Uh, that amplify historic marginalization and discrimination against people with disabilities. And um, a lot of uh, variable technologies, for example, fitness trackers and, and health applications uh, collect health information of people, which is then used to infer disability status. And then uh, it, is, it, it eventually results in discrimination. Some of uh, the literature particularly raised alarms against uh, technologies that quote unquote seek to fix uh, disabilities. So a good example is uh, autism diagnosis technologies that uh, inherently functions to, to fix autistic people, right? So which is a very troubling uh, uh, technology there. And from, from the risks comes our theme two that we, uh, we tried exploring in our, in our uh, uh, survey and focus group discussion. So um, through our uh, discussion, what we realized is that the general opinion of our participants was not exactly fear, but they were definitely concerned about the misuse of AI technologies. Um, People particularly said that they were anxious about technologies that are only trained on data of non-disabled people and that these technologies would not recognize their disabled bodies. Um, people also asked crucial questions as to uh, where the data in these technologies come from, uh, who has control over that data, uh, and so on. Uh, 
Um, we also discussed uh, medical technologies and medical devices that collect uh, health information and how uh, this could have discrimination and diagnosis and treatment and so on. Uh, around 44% of our survey participants said that they uh, have some skepticism and some anxiety uh, around AI technology. So that is, that is I think, uh, a good number there, right? Um, when we talk about risks, I think one of the biggest uh, issues that is very un, uh, uh, understudied and not discussed is the issues of privacy in the context of people with disabilities. So many technologies that our participants have been using are also called Internet of Things. That's a nomenclature. A lot of Internet of Things technology also uh, are comprise of artificial intelligence. So we're not going into the details of that, but uh, uh, you know, these IOTs such as dictation tools, closed captioning, uh, some forms of screen readers and many other technologies offer a lot of potential and benefits in the context of independent living. Uh, for example, it could give a person with disability some confidentiality. Uh, if a person with speech disability or a physical disability, for example, wants to communicate and they were earlier relying on a human caregiver to do that, they could now uh, use an AI tool to to communicate with more confidentiality. Right? So there are there are definitely benefits of these technologies. But what also happens here is uh, that uh, companies that build these technologies and control these technologies collect vast uh, data about people with disabilities, which is then used to surveil them, to control their activities, to send them targeted advertisements, and and to inherently breach and violate their privacy. Um, for us, uh, from, from the literature, what we realize is that there is little to no uh, empirical data on uh, on the experiences of privacy uh, for people with disabilities. So I think this study is is a good uh, first step forward um, there. And this is our this is our theme from the privacy discussion. What we uh, gained from our focus group discussion and in our survey. So in our survey, firstly, we had asked if people were concerned about AI technologies violating their privacy. So 44% people said that they were moderately concerned about their privacy. 32% participants said that they were very concerned about their privacy. Uh, and 19% participants said that they were not concerned about their privacy. Uh, we also, in the focus group discussion, had a long discussion around cookie cookie messages where they to get on websites, and uh, people said that they especially find it very difficult to to reject or to uh, um, work with cookie messages because uh, uh, it involves a lot of labor and that they are in a way compelled to accept uh, cookies in, in different websites. Um, participants also said that, uh, you know, they generally assume that their private information is not secured with uh, technologies, and that is even before AI came in. Um, now I'll, I'll, you know, I'm going to the end of my presentation and uh, you know, uh, as you can recall, I started my presentation with the positive sides of the intersection of AI and independent living. Here comes the risks. Uh, why is AI particularly risky for, for independent living, the core of uh, NL study here? So uh, to give you an example, exoskeletons, robotic arms, and cochlear implants uh, also integrate a lot of AI these days. And popular media often uh, says that these technologies are uh, very good for independent living for people with disabilities. But what we realized from our literature is that uh, scholars such as Ashley Shu and Chloe Crawford have, have criticized these technologies uh, because they uh, create a normative vision of the world. They say uh, what these technologies seek to do is that, for example, if you are a wheelchair user, uh, uh, they would put you in, put an exoskeleton on you because uh, the idea of of exoskeletons is that uh, you know a person with a normal uh, able bodied uh, would be able to walk, climb stairs, and and uh, do other things with their limbs. So you know they are they are trying to change the very identity of uh, of us uh, of of people with disabilities, and so uh, you know there is a lot of risk there. 
Uh, the other example is we we saw that a lot of participants use um, dictation tools. Uh, now these dictation tools are based on voice samples and scholars in Access Now have have explained how a lot of these voice samples are used in in collection of sensitive data such as uh, you know emotional data and mental illnesses and how it can be used in in surveilling people based on their uh, their chances of getting depression or anxiety so i think there are a lot of lot of large level risks here uh, when you say that you know there are two sides of the coin uh, that on the one hand these technologies might be offering some benefits but they also pose a lot of risks and this is my final um, uh, point on uh, how ableist technologies can affect independent living so uh, you know, we have seen the history of independent living movement, and one of the biggest, uh, I think, achievements, especially in the U.S. and European Union, was deinstitutionalization. Uh, in the United States, recently, some states like Arkansas and Idaho, uh, the government was using an algorithmic tool to calculate how much care do people with disabilities need. And what happened is because these algorithms were biased. Um, people with disabilities lost a lot of care hours. And there was a large outcry from disability rights activists and advocates that this put uh, people with disabilities at the risk of institutionalization. Um, similarly, it happened with Facebook. In the US, Facebook was found to be allowing advertisers to, uh, you know, to exclude people with disabilities from housing advertisements. So, what essentially happens is if you are a blind person, if you are uh, using Facebook to say search for a white cane, or if you're a deaf person and joining an online community of deaf people, Facebook would in, uh, infer that, you know, you are a blind person or you're a deaf person, share that information with advertisers, and it would then be used to, uh, you know, deprive you of, of housing. So what does all of this come to? It could come to uh, forcing people back into the institutions and, and violating the very, very core of our independent living philosophy, which is community integration and, and community living. So finally, this is my conclusion. Um, I think we need to uh, put both the benefits and risks of AI uh, at, at equally to, to assess uh, uh, how these AI systems are impacting people with disabilities. Um, people with disabilities need more access uh, to information about these technologies, to both the benefits and the risks. We need to focus on the basic tenets of the independent living movement, uh, choice, autonomy, agency, and self-determination uh, when we also think about AI technologies. And um, finally, I think we need a more representation of people with disabilities in both the development and deployment of uh, technologies uh, to, to, to have a better governance model there. Uh, and these are, these are my, my further readings. Um, I am happy to you know, take questions uh, later in the Q&A about this if, if you have any questions. Um, and I'll not take more, more time here. I think Bjorn is uh, waiting to present as well. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm very uh, grateful to all the participants for their feedback, for their um, for their participation, and and thank you so much, uh, Anil, for doing uh, you know this great work. Thanks, thanks, Anil, for Andrea. Very great, very good presentation. Very interesting, and uh, respect you gave the time. This is not very uncommon. So well done, you stayed on time. And uh, I mean, I keep a lot of points from what you said. I keep that something you said in the beginning, for example, for example, that AI is not here to, to take you know, the human support and people, it's just, you know, it can be in parallel and it's about you know, our choice and support and you know, we can do together. Uh, I really, I mean, I keep a lot of other points. I like that you specified, uh, you know, the risks. We need, you know, to be aware of them. Uh, as you said, there is some discussion about, you know, uh, some scholars saying uh, that our identity as people, as disabled people, it gets uh, into risks, into risk at some point. 
uh, you know, with some ideas that are prevalent in the AI community. But, you know, if it's used it correctly, as we said, it can, you know, support disabled people and, go and be a, a huge potential for independent living and for disabled people and for everyone in general. But let's see how how Bjorn how, can, you know, take the discussion further with their work at uh, Bridge the Gap. And I'm sure, you know, he will also examine both the risks and the benefits and a lot of other interesting things. So Bjorn, I give the floor to you. And before that, just to say to people, please put in the chat if you have questions and, you know, and comments. We are monitoring that. And after Bjorn, there will be time for Q&A. So don't hesitate to prepare your thoughts and ideas. And yeah, Bjorn, thank you. Okay, um, let me first of try to share my, or oh, try to share my, uh, uh, my screen, but apparently it isn't possible. Only meeting organizers and presenters can share the screen for some reason. Uh, not sure I why I'm, I'm not able. Ah, okay. That now looks a little bit better. Um, your I feel, I'm sorry, now. I thought I'd made you a presenter, but you certainly are now. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we do. Okay. So let me switch over to Keynote and let's start. Okay, um, I start with uh, AI between wow, cool, and uh, maybe we should think about this. Um, because I believe it's somewhere in between there. Um, so let me start by saying who we are. Um, we are a company trying to bridge the gap between uh, tech companies or companies in general um, and people with disabilities. Uh, and by we, I mean, we are currently two people. Uh, my colleague is Christian Bayerlein. Maybe some of you might know him. Uh, he's um, a web developer and an accessible activist. Um, and he's also a TED co-speaker. Maybe some of you know what uh, uh, TED, the uh, big three red letters is. Uh, TED stands for technology, um, entertainment and design. A lot, of, uh, a lot of people think it's uh, technology, education and design. No, it's not education, it's entertainment. Um, and it's um, simply about uh, presenting a lot of cool things. But uh, in the background, it's also about networking. Um, and it's a little bit like the cooler version of the World Economics Forum. Um, then he's also a movie star. And we are both both a board member of the Action Mensch EV on the Expert Committee on Digital Participation. And of course, we are both uh, member of the Bridge to Cap. So, sure. a little bit about me. Uh, I'm an IT specialist. Um, that's what I uh, what I learned. Um, I'm a photographer, doing a few projects with people with disabilities. I'm a maker and 3D printing uh, enthusiast, working with Christian, um, trying to make his wheelchair better and uh, a lot of pe uh, people's um, uh, lives in, in wheelchair better. As I said, also a member of the Action Mensch uh, Expert Committee. Okay, so now uh, let's get into TED a little bit. Um, and let's show you one of the cool things we did, uh, Christian was, as I said, a co-speaker, and he flew uh, a drone on the main stage at TED in Vancouver via EMG, so via uh, the residual energy of his muscles. Uh, pretty cool stuff. Um, and during TED, uh, we, of course, were able to make a few uh, cool network contacts, meet a few, uh, few people, and uh, due to that, 
uh, we met um, the chief evangelist of AI for Google. Um, nice uh, title. I believe he gave it to himself because he was that high up uh, that you can do that. Um, uh, he was able to connect us to a few people, uh, especially Christopher Petno. He is the head of uh, accessibility um, and inclusion for Google EMEA. EMEA stands for Europe, the Middle East and Africa. So if you want to talk to someone, he's the guy. And he um, he basically said, yeah, if you're ever in London, um, come to us. We build a really cool center called the ADC, Accessibility Discovery Center. Um, we are uh, showcasing a lot of cool um, stuff for people with disabilities. And it's also a space where um basically the, the the whole public can come and visit it um sh looks a little bit like this um but uh of course going to london was a little bit hard for us and that's where the edf came in and said okay um we will give you funding to go there and talk about uh the uh, ai stuff they do so we were able to visit the ADC. Let me get into a few things, uh, what you see there. Uh, first off, uh, the left picture is um, an, an eye tracking device. Um, the up above is uh, a braille book um, of Harry Potter, the first Harry Potter book. And on top you see the first Harry Potter book. So you see how many pages it actually takes uh, in a, a braille form, um, and you see a few of uh, accessibility uh, stuff like a watch for uh, for blind people and stuff like that, and the PlayStation uh, accessibility controller. Finally, uh, I was able to see it uh, in person for the first time. Okay, so uh, but we went there to see a few AI-based accessibility tools. Let me get through them, uh, and um, if I um, I say something wrong, please correct me um, in the Q and A uh, later. So I hope I don't get them mixed up because the words are sometimes uh, so sound about the same. <clears throat> okay, Lookout uh, is a simple tool from Google. Um, giving you a way to um, to point your camera at some point and uh, simply show you uh, what you see. Live caption, of course, simply gives you live captions for all the videos on screen. Project guideline is a pretty cool tool uh, from Google um, where they basically uh, print uh, either a line on the on the street or use the, uh, the lines um, somewhere to guide a blind person so they can run. Live transcribe um, is, uh, now you got me there, I, I don't exactly know what that oh live transcribe is i believe um also for something like the automatic uh, transcribe from google uh which is on uh on the um the last uh thing then you have live view um which gives you in google maps a way where it overlays a lot of things. Then you have personal voice uh, from Apple. So they not only showcase Google stuff, but they also showcase Apple stuff, which is pretty cool. Um, so these are really cool tools. Unfortunately, um, they are uh, buried in the accessibility menus and not people not many people know about them uh, so we try to showcase them 
uh, we try to do um, some social media posts about them, talk to a lot of people with disabilities about them. Uh, but still, um, there is a really, uh, really cool AI stuff out there for people with disabilities. And uh, oftentimes it, uh, it don't get used. So this is a picture taken with guided frame, um, something uh, that's on the Google Pixel 7 and 8. Uh, it simply says uh, to blind people how many people are, on, uh, are in the frame so that blind people can take a picture, a selfie. Uh, pretty cool tool. Um, I hope you can uh, hear my voice when I click now. Not sure. Uh, could you hear that? Are you able to hear my voice? Not sure. I hope no, so. No, we were not. Ah, ah, okay. So that was basically personal voice from Apple. You create uh, your own voice for people that lost, uh, that would, that will lose their voice, which can um, be used for stuff like. Uh, people with basically for throat cancer in the worst case, but also imagine you are going on a big concert, um, having a sore throat for three days after and only can whisper and you uh, you know you have a really important phone, phone call the next day, you use personal voice and you are able to make the phone call. So it can help uh, people with uh, which are uh, other uh, otherwise disabled uh, or um, which are non-disabled. So, okay, let me get into the promise of AI uh, for something like uh, what what does Forbes say or CNN or New York Times? Um, AI-powered app helps people with visual impaired to navigate. Wearable device uses AI to help blind people see with sound. AI powered speech recognition gives a voice to those who can't speak. So really cool stuff. And there is cool things, but this is a picture taken from a Spider-Man movie and a quote taken from a Spider-Man movie with great power comes great responsibility. And now let me get into the pro and the cons of AI. Um, Matreya get, uh, got into that um, a bit more thoroughly um, or in a different direction. Um, but um, of course, it enhances accessibility. Like I said, uh, I showed you some, some software tools right now. Um, I showed you there's also some uh, hardware tools like uh, brain computer interfaces that enables it uh, people to to um, experience the world uh, the world for the first time and by experience I mean for instance we know uh, of a device that you put on your head and a girl with cerebral palsy was simply able to put on a switch um, and um, where you can simply press a button on and off um, and uh, it interpreted her uh, brain signals and Neuralink made it possible uh, for a people uh, for a person to control a PC right now the Neuralink from um, uh, I believe it's not Tesla but uh, Elon Musk, uh, one of Elon Musk's companies. Uh, personal learning can be a really cool thing. So um, a way to adapt uh, certain materials to people with different uh, disabilities. Say, for instance, um, if you have a cognitive uh, ability uh, that you can uh, get, for instance, uh, transcribe tools 
um, where you can go back and uh, look at it again. Um, and you also get improved diagnostics for certain uh, problems and so certain um, uh, disabilities that are really bad, but also the improved di diagnostics can be a problem for disabilities. Um, like for instance, uh, we talked to a, a person from the Ford Foundation, Rebecca Coakley. She's the um, head of uh, disability from the uh, Ford Foundation. She said uh, dwarf, dwarfism will be extinct uh, in a few years because um, they are now able to uh, diagnose it uh, in the genome and uh, they can switch off uh, uh, the uh, this genome so there won't be any per uh, people with uh, dwarfism um, anymore. Um, also, of course, there's the bias. Um, for instance, um, it's really hard uh, if you try to look at uh, an image generating AI, try to uh, use it to generate an image of a wheelchair. Um, you will also, uh, you will most definitely get uh, something like the typical hospital wheelchair. Um, Google's uh, Gemini AI were better at it, but uh, don't know if you're aware, um, it had quite a few other problems because it, it corrected uh, the problems ChatGPT had, uh, but it overcorrected um, and you got some, some other problems in the wrong direction. Uh, in the other wrong direction. Um, AI will reduce jobs um, and the people in the AI industry will always say yes, but it will create um, these whole other jobs. Yes, but uh, it can be a real problem for people with disabilities. Um, there's also um, the matter of cost because some of these AI tools can be really costly. Say, for instance, uh, right now, ChatGPT 3.5 is free. If you want to use ChatGPT 4, there are ways to use it, but um, if you want to use the normal version, it's, uh, I believe, 22 euros. Um, there are different tools um, and, and software. For instance, if you are a disabled person and you, uh, you say, oh, I really want uh, the, the, the ability to make a selfie um, of myself. It's a, such a cool feature. I finally be able to take a, a picture of myself. Um, yeah, yeah. You can you can do that. You can simply buy the Google Pixel, um, but it does uh, cost um, a lot. Uh, of course, Matreya went into that data privacy. Uh, it's a really big factor. Um, and another big factor is uh, the reduced human interaction. Uh, because um, even small things like um, a chat that's now run by an AI, it can help people, but um, oftentimes a chat uh, bot isn't as good as a normal uh, person. And especially for people with disabilities, certain um, AI tools give you um, a small window to answer a question. And uh, if you have a cognitive disability or for instance, say you have a speech um, impairment, 
uh, some systems simply can't understand you. So that's a real big problem. So that's my last slide. Um, I don't want you, I, I want to leave you uh, ex, uh, with the contra because oftentimes uh, people get really hyped uh, by AI, especially the guys working uh, with AI. They're always uh, saying, yes, there are risks, but but look at the good side. There's, there's way more good. Um, they are right, of course, but um, let's look at the contra as well. Okay, that's it from me. Um, I'm not sure how much time I used. I hope not too much. Thank you, Bjorn. Thank you. No, you didn't use too much. You were also perfect on time, like my trail. So that's that's you know that makes a moderator very happy when the speakers keep the time, and that's good. We because we we have around 15 minutes, a bit more uh, for the Q and A. Before that, I want to say that there was a question in the chat both for you and for my three, I guess, if you can share the, the presentations and make them available to, to the audience of the conference. <coughs> uh, yes, we can. Um, there is, uh, I, I'm not sure how we can do that right now. You can send it to uh, me and I will share it with people of the conference. Awesome. That's fine, yeah. If awesome. you can hook up with us we'll we'll, we'll make sure. sure everybody gets a copy thank um, you and for, sure. i think for the for my presentation i think we are also uh, going to uh, you know write this in the form of a fact sheet uh, that would be available on Enel's website very soon so i think that that would also be a good resource yes so all the information i shared would uh, uh, form a far part of a fact sheet yes thank you my Maitreya. that's right this is part of the work you know, for the development of a function, and it will be, will be available also on our website. And just to say, because Bjorn mentioned the EDF fund funding on AI, this is also part, part of EDA funding, the work of ENIL. So we basically here for two, we had about two projects found by the European Disability Forum related to AI and disability. And it's very interesting to see, you know, how you know we approach, you know, AI and the challenges and the risks, but also the opportunities, both from any perspective and Maitreya in that case, and from the Bridge the Gap perspective and Bjorn. Uh, I think there was one more question in the chat uh, to Bjorn. Fascinating tools, Bjorn. Do you bridge, do Bridge the Gap publish any guidance on availability or even reviews of this kind of technology? Um, yes, we uh, we um, published some reviews. Uh, we don't get into a deep dive of everything, uh, but um, I personally reviewed the uh, personal voice feature. Um, I tried it with the harshest critic there is, uh, my wife, um, and uh, she listened to it and, and said, uh, Yes, it sounds like a computer voice, but it even sounds like you. So um, I, I guess that uh, that's a real pro for it. Um, if the harshest critics uh, says gives it a thumbs up, uh, it's okay, I believe. Um, we at Bridge the Gap uh, currently uh, try to get in touch with. Uh, anyone at Google um, or at Microsoft or any other company um, that will give us a little bit of uh, insight of the training data. But uh, getting uh, to this information is, we found out really hard. Um, as uh, I alluded a little to a little bit, um we are we met a few important people and i would say um we have a better start than most but even we um have a really hard time 
um, speaking to a person that can actually give us access. And I believe if, uh, if uh, even Enil and Camille tries to do this, it'll be hard for them as well because uh, Google and Google DeepMind um, and even Microsoft and ChatGPT, they really don't want to let people know about the training data and how they train the AI. Um, and what I alluded to a little bit um, in the um, my presentation when I said uh, the Google Gemini uh, image generator went into the wrong direction. Uh, um, it, well, let me just answer to one question. Maybe they don't know themselves. Um, that's actually one uh, one part of it. And I can uh, tell you a little bit about that uh, after uh, the Gemini uh, thing I wanted to, to tell now. Um, the Gemini had a problem uh, where it uh, tried to be too diverse. So um, if you ask for uh, persons from the uh, Wehrmacht, from the Second World War, it would generate uh, people uh, that are black and uh, Asian. Uh, so Asian uh, Wehrmacht uh, uh, soldiers, uh, of course, that's a little bit too diverse. I, I don't think that'll be uh, possible. So the AI, AI over generated in that kind. Uh, now let me get into the, uh, maybe they don't know themselves. Um, a lot of the training data don't, uh, at least at, uh, in the beginning, didn't come from ChatGPT themselves, but it actually came from another company. Um, well, I'm not really sure how the guy is called right now. But he had actually two companies. Um, one was a company where he sold the training data. And one was a company that was kind of a shadow company, actually, uh, where even the guy didn't want to talk about. Um, that was set up in a way where um, he would uh, have people working in poor countries like Pakistan and India. And uh, they were basically click monkeys. They would train an AI uh, on what, what uh, the AI is seeing. And uh, that was uh, the big problem. Uh, so uh, yeah. these click monkeys, uh, weren't of course being paid fairly sure um and um uh, they generated uh, the data and the data was then sold uh, to chat uh, gpt so they uh, actually uh, at least in the beginning didn't know how the uh, data was generated yeah thank you thank you Bjorn, for May uh, yeah. something okay yeah and i want to say thank you to Bjorn for bringing this up. That's to say yeah. that we have, I think, six minutes left. So can I, can I ask something? Yeah, yes, please do. Who is speaking, oh. by the way, because I think we cannot uh, see you. Oh, Radoslav, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Radoslav, please Thank introduce you. yourself and say who you want to ask. Yeah, uh, uh, maybe maybe every, to everybody, but- Okay, just, I would just ask people to, to keep the yeah. answer short. Ba so we can- uh, Basically, uh, to Bjorn, that of course, uh, thank you for all information. And uh, I understand that big mogul like Microsoft and uh, Google don't want to show you uh, secret sauce <laughs> because of, you know, there is a lot of reasons why. But uh, now uh, I just think about how can we continue and develop uh, this topic like AI and disabilities. Uh, maybe we could to start to talk uh, with uh, some beautiful organization like V15, it's a whole world organization. Maybe we could to uh, cooperate together with uh, this company or organization 
and starts to um, talk maybe with company like Google and Microsoft, like all disabled person all, all the world, because there's a, a different numbers, uh, because there is, I think it's something around 15%, 15% of population on planet Earth is with disability. Uh, and this is a absolutely different talking with companies. If we we will be able to create some something like uh, uh, AI in a video 15 or something like that, uh, that uh, we will be able to communicate like uh, one group or member of group on this planet i think uh, we could to be uh, much more effective maybe we uh, we can find some solution and start to communicate it about ideas how can we use ai for disabled person there is a lot of potential what we could to develop this is why i am really very happy that uh, uh, we meet together here by annual thank you really and it's just challenge that if uh, we want to develop and continue with uh, with this idea and uh, this topic. Okay. Thank you, Radoslav, thank you. Just yep. to say there is one more question in the chat from Pippa. I will read it and then I will give the floor to, to both Maitre and Bjorn to answer relatively quick because we have like three minutes left. So, and of course we can continue the discussion online in emails and stuff. So Pippa is asking, is writing, Thank you for the interesting presentations. I am concerned about the possibility of reduced human interactions due to, due to AI. And some customer service interactions have already been replaced by chatbots. chatbots. How can we mitigate this risk and ensure we are still able to choose human interactions, even when this might be perceived as more costly? So who wants to go first? Whoever goes first, Anyway, keep it short, please, both of you. Okay, Bjorn, you start. Uh, we can't. Short answer. Okay. Um, it's, up to, very, it's up to the company. That was very quick. <laughs> that was very quick. <laughs> okay, and do you want to answer also something to Radoslav? Or we go to, to my Maitreya? Once more, please. No, no, I'm asking Bjorn if you want, if you want to comment also. Uh, on what you said, or if oh, we go okay. to the next one. Yeah, yeah, I, I would oh. like to know if can we continue in dialogue after oh. this meeting. Yeah, we definitely can continue the dialogue. Also on any platform, we want to continue these discussions in our movement. Oh, so we amazing. will give opportunities for people to meet again. My dear, do you want to add something and to, I don't know, any final thoughts and comments on the discussion? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's very difficult to to not interact with chatbots. Um, I think we'll just need better governance. And I think we've been seeing a lot of uh, talk these days. If you go and Google this recent incident with Air Canada, I think uh, now there is a lot of discussion on it and the government, you know, might also try to regulate it uh, in the US and, and otherwise. So um, I think, you know, uh, these things will take time, but I think with better governance and regulations, we might be able to. Uh, see some changes there. Camille? Yes, Bjorn, go on and we we'll um, I want to I want to give you one glimmer of hopes at the end. Um, the EU just regulated AI a little bit. Uh, the act will be in place at least uh, 2026 uh, fully. So there is a way that the EU is actually working on regulating AI. So there is a glimmer of hope it will get better, or at least it it won't get uh, worse. So, thank you, thank you for the thumbs up and the positive message for the end. And uh, I mean, yeah, uh, I hope the regulation of EU, you know, it's uh, is you know, uh, uh, sorry, is uh, uh, meaningful and it you know is uh, implemented because not every regulation works in the end. And I know you know it contributes to a change of the world. In the meantime, we are already, it's time to finish. So I want to thank all the speakers, Maitreya and Bjorn, as well as our hosts today. So Self-Directed Support Scotland and the National Voice Conference for the opportunity to have this session together. I want to invite people to follow 
first of all, Safe Directly Support Scotland and you know the recordings that will be available, I guess, afterwards on the website and maybe on YouTube. So you can follow all the sessions they have today because they have many sessions and probably many of you follow all of them. I want also to invite you to follow the work of ENIL, the European Network for Independent Living on our website, both on AI and everything else about independent living, and also to follow Bridge the Gap and their work about you know, technology and AI and everything they do. And with that in mind, I want also to thank all of you who spent one hour with us and dedicated your afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. So thanks a lot. Have a good day. Uh, I give the final, final word to Jeremy in case I forgot something. Thanks a lot from my side. Oh, thanks so much, uh, Camille. That was a fantastic uh, information from Atreya and Bjorn today. Um, it was, it's kind of like fascinating, exciting, cool, and a little bit scary, all in equal measures um, uh, for, I think, for everybody, not just um, for for independent living, um, but particularly the exposure that you have in independent living. That was really interesting to hear about that um, uh, from Matreya. So um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut us a bit short. I think that I'm just looking out the window here and seeing where the plenary is. We're only a couple of minutes away, I think. Um, so I'll, I'll sign out, but just with, with deep thanks and gratitude for coming along today for everyone from uh, uh, the European Network of Independent Living.